Welcome to another episode of the Gay Archive Show, where we explore gay history one bar at a time. I'm your host, Art Smith. So tonight's special guest on the Gay Archive Show is someone I've known for quite a few years. I first met this cute, shy boy named Monty in Atlanta, and before too long... He stepped on stage and kind of skyrocketed to the top of the local performance scene. Um, Monty, as you may know him, was uh, called Raven on stage and had the nickname of the Barbie doll lookalike of the South. So, Monty, tell us, when, when you first came to Atlanta and started exploring the gay scene, you were kind of a quiet, shy type person. Um... And then before too long, you entered a um, talent show at Backstreet Mm -hmm. and did exceptionally well. How did that change your perspective on the gay community in Atlanta? Oh, my Lord. It changed my whole life. Um, Oh, first, thank you, Art, for having me. I I really appreciate that. Um, I I think the, the nightlife was was crucial in my evolution as an, as an entertainer. Um, I certainly went out and partied, <laughs> you know, before I started doing female impersonation, uh, constantly. I was, I was like everyone else. Backstreet was the be all end all of my whole world. Uh, if I wasn't there during the week, I was waiting tables to make money to go out or I was, thinking about what I was going to do, um, and uh, it just, one thing, it, it was very cathartic, one thing just, you know, led to another and put me in a situation that I'd never planned on, but it was extremely important <clears throat> in my evolution, so to speak. Now, when you entered the the uh, pageant there, had had that been something you'd ever done before? Had you performed on stage or done any type of drag or theatrics that you thought, yeah, I can do this? I did. I did in, in Oklahoma, actually, before I before I moved there, actually in Fort Smith. It's all kind of the same area here in Arkansas. Uh, I'm in Oklahoma. It's right on the border. But if we, I would go out there, um, very small town, very small bar, and there was um, an entertainer by the name of Paige Fox, uh, she's pretty legendary, but she was sick, uh, and, and she was positive, and she was going to have a benefit to raise money, and she asked everyone to perform, and there wasn't a whole lot of entertainers and asked me if I would do it, and I was like, well, if you paint me up, I'll do it, and I, I went out and I, <laughs> I did the locomotion by Kylie Minogue, <laughs> and um it just kind of brought the house down. I had fun, but I didn't want to be a drag queen, so to speak. And I didn't really do anything else until uh, my family and I moved to Atlanta in 88. And God, that's so long ago. (laughs) Um, And I, you know, partied for a while, but I never really did drag. And then I went to see at the 14th Street Playhouse a play called The Vampire Lesbians of Sodom. (laughs) And the main character was the succubus, was the uh, uh, vampire, and it was a drag queen. And I thought it was the coolest character in the world, so uh, shortly after that was Halloween, and I thought, well, I'm going to go as that succubus. So that's exactly what I did, and... um, I met uh, Lewis from Backstreet. He he was doing a show at 688 Spring the old weekend. Right. And um, asked me if I would perform there on Sunday nights with him. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not a drag queen. <laughs> no, this is just for fun. And he's like, well, we'll pay you, you know, 50 bucks and you got a bar tab and it didn't start to one. And so I was like, oh, why not? So I did. And. And it was a, wow, like a creative explosion for me. It just, 
everything just kind of fell into place, even though it was a late night show on Sundays and no one really saw it. And no one came either. It was like six or eight people. Um, one night it was just like Apple Love was there and Lady Bunny and Lily White. And, you know, I would just like, it was like pulling teeth, you know, I would really pour everything into it. And those few people would make a lot of noise, but it, you know, wasn't bringing the house down, so to right. speak. And it was Lily and Lady Bonnie that were, um, that approached me afterwards. And they told me about this talent show they had at Backstreet. And, um, I, I said, well, why not? I'll, I'll do that. And I prepared for it. And, and I took that same kind of peace pulling kind of energy. You know, you're really working hard for very few people and very few applause, uh, very little applause. And I did that there to a packed house. And I was just floored by the reaction that I got. And it, I thought, well, they all do that. You know, because I'd gone to see a few shows at Lavita's and Lipstick, um, but then I, I kind of won that hands down, and wow, Charlie Brown asked me if I would come back and perform on Friday, and then on Friday she asked me to be a cast member, which was unheard of. Yeah, usually there was a long, there. usually there was kind of a long waiting period for between, you know, a guest performance one night and getting on cast there. So that was a big deal. She was obviously, um, he was obviously yeah, impressed. Did, it was like a, what was it? I, well, you were around then. I think it was yeah. like a, a season long thing, like, like several months, six or eight months of talent shows. And the winner would come back and compete with the, the one that won and they'd bring all of them back. And at the very end of all that time, uh, Charlie would make a decision, and if she felt that there was somebody she wanted to be on cash, she would put the winner on, you know, guest rotation. Right. So, yeah, it was a, a huge deal. I didn't even know how big of a deal it was at the time that she just, you know, plucked me out and said, this is my new cast member, and eventually, of course, her drag daughter. But, and, yeah. Uh, and if you if you had to have the support... I eventually came to, to, to understand the importance of it, but, yeah. Well, if you had to have the support of some drag queens in Atlanta in the 80s, <laughs> certainly, yeah. you know, Lady Bunny, um, Lily White, and Charlie Brown <laughs> were the magical, you know, three wise men that you would want on your side. Um, the Holy Trinity. Yeah, the yeah. Holy Trinity. They were definitely... I didn't, I didn't know then how big of a deal that was. I just took it for granted because I thought, well, they do this all the time. And of course, later I realized how legendary they were, and and how important it was. But, oh, they were they were lovely. And Bunny was in New York, of course, but she came down all the time, and uh, she just happened to be there that night. And um, yeah, so I had the support of some pretty amazing people. Now back and then, in, of course, Bertha Butts worked there, and other legends. And I wasn't competition, so to speak. Right. I was the new girl and so everybody wanted to teach me something and I wanted to learn as much as I could from everybody so yeah well and you were quite different from a lot of the different you know, the other performers that had been there a long time and had performed I had seen shows in Atlanta from the early 80s you know on and there were a lot of really good uh, production numbers and individual numbers at multiple mm -hmm. clubs around town, whether it was Illusions, Levitas, Lipsticks, Backstreet, wherever it was, there were plenty of venues that were doing quality uh, drag shows oh, yeah. at the time. But when you burst onto the scene, you brought a completely different look, a completely different energy, and a few different elements... Uh, that were pretty much not seen before that I can recall in Atlanta. Most most memorably, of course, do I have to say it? Your fire act. Because everybody on the planet... Fire, fire, fire! <laughs> were you a pyromaniac as a child? <laughs> it's a funny story. Uh, 
funny. I just posted something on Facebook just recently. My cousin was posting, and um, my my grandpa he uh, he drank a bit, and his name his name ironically was Otis, <laughs> <laughs> like the guy from Andy Griffith. Uh-huh. Anyway, we were messing around, and I think I was like ten, and he had a short buzz cut, and he used to wear tons of stuff in it, and and I was like, oh, I think if you like struck a match to it, it might flame up and his hair caught on fire and we were beating on top of his head and he woke <laughs> up. And <laughs> he was okay, though. But no, not really pyromaniac. <laughs> so how did that whole um, number come to your mind? How did that... I, uh, I, but I, had a, I had an unusually weird bond with this song, Tonight is What It Means to Be Young, the Jim Steinman song from Streets of Fire. And I loved that song and that was the first song I did it at weekends and it, you know, fire just kind of evolved into it and now I think if you you know if you were to try to do that number without the fire people would just kind of mm-hmm. leave <laughs> no, mean, they lose their mind. not just you but anybody <laughs> I, I think... don't do it at a, in any main you know show that I headline no matter where I go if I don't do that no matter how sick I am of doing it after all those years people would be disappointed and right. that's that's just not possible for me <laughs> but the good news is that you own that now, and nobody can come after you and duplicate that without the fire. If they do it without the fire and anybody's ever seen you do it, they're just going to be like, boo, go away. <laughs> oh, those poor girls. I feel bad for that, but <laughs> good at the same time. Um, yeah, it just became part of my part of my identity. It was something that just happened to work out really, really good. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I take most things that happened as, you know, that happened because I was in the right place at the right time, or no matter how grand I try to sound sometimes, I was just pretty amazed at each one of those opportunities, and I never, I never thought I was quite that good in my head, which I guess a lot of creative people think that way, you know? But uh, nothing was ever good enough to me, and I was always my biggest competition, so, yeah, I just... <clears throat> I, I had a lot of opportunities come my way from that. Now, after you started performing at Backstreet, and you started, mm-hmm. you know, honing your your style <clears throat> and getting all the numbers and everything down, how what how long was it from the time you started on the Backstreet cast until the time you actually entered and won a pageant? Oh wow, it was. Uh... So I don't even know. It was like, it was a few years. Uh, Charlie, Charlie was very against me doing any kind of pageants. And she would tell me, you know, you are, you're, you're the new girl and, and your, your talents are a bit threatening, but at the same time, everybody wants to teach you stuff. But once you do that and cross over your competition uh. and, uh, yeah, she kept me out of it for about three years. And then I, I, uh, I don't even remember if I told her I was going to Knoxville to enter the Miss Knoxville pageant. Um, but yeah, I, I, I went up and did that like three years after I started performing. And I, I, that was a whole different, a whole, you know, new aspect of, of drag, uh, you know, the, the pageant side. So it was a good three years. <laughs> you, you also incorporated a lot of... Um gymnastic type maneuvers into your act which some of the other performers couldn't or chose not to do so you also had that aspect of your uh performances that was distinctive um was that something that that came from your childhood or was that something that evolved as part of drag and you said hey i need to do you know something more athletic in here right no, I just, uh, you know, I, I took karate when I was little. I, like most people, I think my, my parents thought I might be beaten up, so they were going to toughen me up. But um, I've always been athletic. I didn't go out for sports or anything like that, but I've just been an athletic person. I just ski, you know, I grew up on a lake here in Oklahoma. Uh, but that just came out. I never, I never practiced or rehearsed. Uh, performing ever because it just seemed weird 
I mean, like, <laughs> what are you going to do, tape bills to your wall? <laughs> <laughs> Pretend you're getting them. No, I, <laughs> I never rehearsed or anything, but I would I would listen to the songs, and that's, that was one of the biggest things for me um, throughout my whole career was I had to really love and identify with the song. And, and there are some songs, like by Melissa Etheridge and Pat Benatar, it's, it's venom in their songs. It's magical. And that just kind of, it just made sense for me to do those little moves here and there. And, and yeah, I guess, I guess I was just naturally flamboyant. Uh, so when, don't ever underestimate the power of a good karate kick. <laughs> <laughs> when you first started on cast at, at Backstreet, and you had all the support from Charlie and Lily and everybody. Did you uh-huh. even at that point envision that becoming an important part of the next couple of decades of your life? Or was it still just, well, I'll do this for a few months and then I'll go back to waiting tables or whatever it is that, you know, comes Actually, next? Actually, no. Once I did it and once I, uh, at Backstreet, you know, weekends was great, but there were hardly any people there. It wasn't, you know, I was being paid like 50 bucks a show, which in that time was amazing, you know. Right. Queens do it for 10 or 15 bucks a show. I, uh, after I went to Backstreet and I got that kind of reaction and I just, I started, I was floored at how much money people would hand me and they didn't start paying me you know, like 50 bucks a show at Backstreet for like a year or two. <laughs> um, clubs are, you know, clubs are great, but they're, you know, for beginners, it's not very financially advantageous. I mean, you, you barely make enough to pay for your makeup. But then I realized, wow, you know, I, I think I can make a career out of this. And it just, uh, it evolved into that. I had my years of doing drugs and staying at Backstreet for the entire weekend. And But I think it was like 95. I was like, no, I'm either going to be a sad old queen in a bar doing enough drag to pay for drugs and makeup, or I can be a professional and turn it into a career. So I stopped doing everything. And you know, put my head down and turned it into a career. But I didn't, I didn't plan on it. But when it came, I realized it was where I wanted to be. Because um, I couldn't sing, but I really loved theater. And to me, drag is the ultimate form of theater. You're not just trying to convince people that, you know, this song belongs to you and conveying emotion, but you're playing a different sex. Right. And so it was just, I was loving it. <laughs> now you were okay. also, you, you were also known for some very skimpy and revealing costumes. Uh, <laughs> was there ever a time when somebody suggested a costume idea for you and you just said, you know, no, that's a little bit, that's going too far. Or would you pretty much, come out there and anything that seemed appropriate for the number to get the crowd, you know, response. It had to, the, the, for me, the, the costume or sometimes lack thereof had to be part of that theatrical presentation that I was giving. Right. It all had to make sense to me. Um, and some of them were just, you know, glorified bras and panties before I got into humongous headdresses and all the other stuff. Um, no one really suggested anything. I, there were things I liked, and there were entertainers I liked, and I kind of knew what I wanted to do. And uh, one person we haven't mentioned so, so far, and it's tragic because we have to, um, when you're talking about my career anyway, is Amber Richards. Uh, Amber provided the gowns for my competition, you know, in the early years and the inspiration that I needed. And <laughs> she was pretty pivotal in that. And she was always telling me, you know, you should, you should really get into bigger costumes. 
And it's Amber's frame of mind that I adopted as far as, you know, no, that's not enough rhinestones. You can always add a hundred more. <laughs> it's not tall enough. You can actually go three feet taller and it'll just barely brush the ceiling. <laughs> or, you know, hey, honey, you're going to turn around in that costume, so you might want to throw a rhinestone in the back. <laughs> right. That her her way of thinking and her her way of being, uh, she she definitely taught me that. Well, there were definitely some great drag queens back then. Um you know, certainly Amber is one of them. Um, I will never forget watching Amber perform. She was just, you know, incredible. And even just as a person. I mean, she lived her entire life, Amazing. obviously, as as a woman. You know, and yes. she was... And there's no way she could have gotten around that, I don't suppose, with those huge breasts. But, um, <laughs> but um, she was just the nicest, you know, person all around. And, um, she there, really was, and her persona was bitchy, but she was very, very, very kind. Right. And there were a couple others that I think of that um, I'm sure you worked with. Um, one of them that comes to mind on the costuming, and I don't know if this had any influence on your costuming or headdresses at all. But Are you going to say Sable Chanel? I am. <laughs> did, you, did you and Sable at all see eye to eye or get along well on the on the stage or backstage? Um, actually, Sable and I didn't really work together all that much. Um, she had, I believe, already moved away when <sighs> I came into performing. But I had certainly been to her shows and she's absolutely mesmerizing. She has that it quality and she knows how to do it and you can see queens today that are mimicking her her pout or she owned it she she was the first queen i ever saw that turned drag into a brand right <clears throat> and um we worked together a few times and i think there was a little may have been a little scruff here and there at one show but we were two you know, queens with big costumes and one show, but she was also, you know, she was very kind to me and very, very sweet. She, I think she was kind to everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, Sable, that, what I was speaking of with Amber about the way she did her costumes and, you know, they weren't sparse on feathers. They were big and thick. Uh, Sable, I think it was her, her husband that yeah. made her costumes for her. In fact, I know it was. Um, they were a great team and that her way of making costumes appealed to me because they weren't sparse they were over the top and they were you had to spend a lot of money to buy a lot of extra feathers and stones and stuff And but that's how you do it you know you don't go out there lacking and yeah Sable was a big influence on me um, and Lauren Michaels Lauren Michaels was amazing uh, she was a big influence on me. Now you didn't really work um, with Lauren much, though, did you? Was was Lauren uh, was Lauren still active uh, on the drag stage in the early nineties? Yeah, yeah. She uh, that was the the about the end though. She had already had no, no, no. She didn't already have it when I first started performing. Um, I got to work with one of my idols, and that was her. Uh. And she performed for a bit, and then she raised the money and went to Brussels and had the change, uh, the operation, and uh, the SNP. And then she came back, and she still performed uh, for a while. Yeah, I guess. And we got to be pretty good girlfriends. She was a bit of a bitch, but... I remember... She was amazing. I'm sure you remember Br Brushstrokes, um, the store. Uh, oh, yes. So... Mark was... I don't think I entered a pageant where Mark didn't sponsor me. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Him. Mark was very supportive. Mark and I judged a number of pageants together um, over the years, and I was kind of involved with um, helping him get a business started when it initially opened uh, in Virginia Highlands, that. and then when they moved to Ansley. But um, I remember being in the, in the store in Virginia Highlands. It must have been the very 
end of 89 or beginning of 90 when um, Lauren had come back from just having surgery and she was in pain and she was saying that um, she yeah. had basically gone yeah, I remember that. she had basically gone to like a 42 double D overnight and her chest and back were so sore she couldn't hardly stand up but um, it was it was quite a day back then when there was this big almost like a a family of people who were supportive of the local drag community and um, and a lot of the performers and Mark Jackson from Brushstroke certainly was and I think that's part of the reason that his business has has thrived and he's still there 30 plus years later yeah absolutely he's he's always been extremely community community minded but what you said what the word you use family is exactly that's exactly what it was like we were the golden kids i guess the queens and we have prominent people in the community um who were like parents to us. Mark was certainly a daddy. Uh, he he would give his opinion um, of suggestions. He would certainly sponsor me for everything I did. And uh, just a, a very caring and supportive person. And it had a big effect on me as an entertainer to have people like Mark that that just lived to support you if you were, you know, worth your salt and in drag. <laughs> but there were, you know, so many others. Um, Bob Taylor was around. He was really great. He, he danced and he worked with Amber a lot. And Tony Desario. I know you remember all these people. Oh, I do. Do drag, but knew good drag. I and just, I just found out. With queens. I'm, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Bob Taylor. And uh, in, really? a couple, in a couple of days, and I, and it was funny because he sent me a message on Thursday or Friday, and said, "Well, I've kind of got a busy weekend scheduled, so can we schedule it for next week?" And I responded to him, <laughs> and I said, "Absolutely, I'm going to be taking this weekend off pretty much because tomorrow, Sunday, is my birthday." So I found out today. That tomorrow was also his birthday. So that was the busy weekend he was having. Yeah, we both had the same birthday. birthday, Thank you. (laughs) Let me get one of my fire torches here and make a candle for you. There you go. So happy happy birthday, sweetie. Thank you. So you um you kind of rose to the, the top of the pile in Atlanta with Backstreet and your performances there. I'm sure there were many weekends and many events where people came to the club in groups to see you, uh, whether they from out of town or they were local people that didn't get out as much. And, uh, you were definitely a draw there, you know, along with, uh, with Lily and, and Charlie, you were one of the, the people that people really talked about when they were talking about Charlie Brown's cabaret. Um, and you started doing guest appearances, I guess, or traveling a little bit to other clubs as well. How, what was the difference between being with your family at Backstreet and then going to another city? Did you get a different type of, of feeling or a different crowd response or did you just basically... I did, re- actually. You would think it's all the same and in many ways, you know, it is. Um, but when I started traveling and going to bars that were you know, a bit different than Backstreet, but every every place was a bit different. But the reaction to me was always something I never could quite get. I loved it, and it was amazing, but I never, I thought, well, you know, really? <laughs> I'm not a brain surgeon. I would think those things in my head. But the people out of town, they don't get to see uh, I, like you were mentioning earlier, the Queens in Atlanta and how amazing they are. Uh, Atlanta was spoiled in a lot of ways when it came to drag. They didn't realize that 
you know, there were so many other cities and places out there that didn't have the quality of entertainment we had in Atlanta. Right. <clears throat> Maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. Maybe it was the fire or the lighting and the duct tape. I don't know. But they really received me. Uh, I felt like Madonna sometimes. <laughs> they would wait outside the dressing room and I would, you know, sign pictures and stuff afterwards. And it was just a, a whirlwind. It really was like a tornado until I got on the plane and came home or drove home or whatever. Um, but they did receive me really well, but I also felt a huge responsibility to where I came from and the people in Atlanta that, you know, helped make me. So it was a, it was a, a tight balancing act there. Now, um, how long, but I, uh, I, I enjoyed that. How long was it? after you had started working at Backstreet and started traveling to other bars before you actually got back to your home state and performed in Oklahoma? <laughs> All right. I, I don't want you to flip out here, but I mean, let me think for a second and make you absolutely sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have never done a show in Oklahoma. Wow. Never. Um, the, the, the place I was telling you about, Fort Smith, Arkansas, is just right on the other side of the border. I live in green country in Oklahoma. It's, it's just right on the border. Um, but I, I, I was always partying. And when I came home, I mean, I was always partying in my earlier years. And drag wasn't a part of it. Right. I just did that one show for Paige Fox. But when I came home... You know, my family, I have a lot of family here. It was to unplug completely and just be with them. So I never, it just happened that way. I never, <laughs> you know, I'm a, So no sequins and feathers in the luggage, just flannel and blue jeans and... <laughs> Absolutely. It was, you know, come home to, to you know, pee on the farm with with, with my family and... And that was a huge, huge thing for me to, you know, spend time with them and make sure it was quality time. So let's but yeah, I would, I would, and when I told, when I got hired at Backstreet, I told, I told Charlie the same way I did other employers. Um, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, I will not be here. I have to go home. And they were supportive of that. <clears throat> now let, let's talk about your family background a little bit. I know, I seem to remember from many years ago that um, you had said something, you know, they, a lot of people talk to performers, drag queens, and say, well, who did you get your sense of style from, or who inspired your, you know, your, your style? And I seem to remember you basically mentioning that your, your female idol in your life was your mother. Is that correct? Did you? That is absolutely correct. That, that was a that was HBO. That was Drag Time. Yeah. Um, and no, that was absolutely true, <clears throat> and still is true. My so, mom is the. Uh, everybody thinks their mom's the greatest. My mom is really the greatest. <laughs> Everything she raised me to be, uh, even when I didn't quite find my way at the time, I always found my way back to it. She instilled uh, a lot of strength in me, and she's still just the most amazing person I've ever met. To be so selfless and take care of your family for so many years so well, and even after I, you know, came out and everything, she, uh, I don't know where I would be a completely different person without her, so... Yeah, that, that that was extremely true, and I'm very, very protective and guarded of my mom. <laughs> like most people are, I'm sure. Your um, where you, where you live now in Oklahoma is that that's the kind of family homestead from even when you were a child? Is that where you grew up in that area? Yes. Yeah, this is where I went to school my whole life. Um, and my niece, who I'm by the grace of God helping raise right now. Um, I'm very lucky to be able to do that. She's going to school where I went to school. 
I know a lot of the same people. I don't really get out a lot, but I mean, I get out, but I don't. Uh, I, you probably wouldn't know me with a ball cap and <laughs> in Zion, Oklahoma. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I. But then again, I gotta say, everything. You know, at one point, especially if you are gay and you want acceptance and get you, you need to get away from a small town, but everything I tried to get away from is what I just craved to get back to. <clears throat> and that's that's Cherokee so, uh, country up there, right? Didn't, uh, didn't you say there's a Cherokee... <laughs> I said, isn't that Cherokee country up there? Didn't you say that there's a Cherokee reservation right there? And Actually, they just turned... Uh, Oklahoma, most of Oklahoma, into a reservation. I'm I'm half Cherokee, and um, very proud of my heritage. Got to land, especially the way they handled this pandemic. They were amazing. In fact, I got to say, they're giving it out now to everybody, and they're letting them choose their vaccines and make their own appointments. They're they're great. Very cool. I, I wish the country would have been run like that. But anyway, uh, yeah, <clears throat> and there's a. Oh, this is the capital of the Cherokee Nation, where I am, and uh, it's a big part of, of my life. It really is. So, did that Cherokee ha be. that Cherokee <laughs> half of you? You have to be native to understand that. But, <laughs> I'm kidding. Go did, ahead. Did the <laughs> did the Cherokee <laughs> side of you was that the one that preferred all the feathers? Was that a a nod to heritage in some sort of way? I, I, I don't know where that came from, but I won't, the Cherokee never really wore the big headdress and stuff like that. They were, you know, buckskins and a very advanced culture back then. They had their own newspaper and their own alphabet and language and everything. Um, so it wasn't really a part of the Cherokee heritage. And I've never done an Indian quote, Indian number right on stage because I, to me, somewhere inside me, I thought it might be disrespectful because they usually weren't in ceremonies. Right. It was the fabulosity down deep that just needed to be watered and sprout out. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to be big and flamboyant and the bigger the better and feathers help you get there. So <laughs> it was because of that, not because of Pocahontas. I see. I'm making fun of Donald Trump. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I mentioned that name. Forget it. Yeah, we, we'll bleep that out. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah. So you had, what, like 25 years of um, onstage performance? Is that about right? Yeah. I, I, it's hard for me to believe, too. But, yeah. So what was the decision to step down? And going from airport to airport and bar to bar and it was nutty. I didn't even get to really enjoy the house I was paying for in Lawrenceville, you know, because <laughs> I was always going. But anyway. So, so what was the, what made the decision after 25 years and as, as far as I can tell, pretty much those entire 25 years, you were a celebrity. I mean, there never came a time yeah. when somebody said, Raven who? Um, what inspired you after 25 years of being in the limelight and, you know, people talking about you, knowing who you were, asking for your autograph or photo with you? After 25 years of that, you decided to step away and kind of return to your roots. How did that decision yeah. come along? Well... It was a little bit of a few different things. And what you just mentioned, it's like a double-edged sword because that's what I craved was the, um, I guess the, they were acknowledging what they saw in me, you know? They were, they were amazing. I wanted that adulation. I wanted that attention. But after a while, I I wanted to get away from it a bit. <clears throat> it's um, 
it's a double-edged sword because you need that, you crave it, they're their love is valid and their love is crucial for your career to blossom. But at the same time, I guess just being me and the way I was raised, there's a very big private part of me too. And I was completely ignoring that. And there's also the, I mean, you have to be pretty selfish to be successful in this career, in this, this business. You, everything's about, the next costume, the next show, because, damn it, they deserve your best. Right. And it was a, I had to make everything I wore. I couldn't, you know, I I couldn't settle for something else from someone else. From that and, and basically managing myself, promoting myself, producing my numbers, uh, making the costumes, it was, it was very hectic, to say the least. But I enjoyed it, and I loved it. Um, and I was already struggling with that. But in, <clears throat> um, well, let's just say that it, things changed to where, I won't go back to the exact time and place and relive all that, but I started having seizures. And um, they were pretty bad. <laughs> And they couldn't tell me why, um, and they couldn't nail down the right combinations of medicines to make me stop. And it was a, a huge struggle because one of the biggest things with, that brings on my seizures is light, uh, very sensitive to light. And right. when you're under the stage lights and the spotlight and a halogen, well, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Right. But I didn't want to, then it became for me, uh, okay, well, you're going to do that to me. I'm going to show you how strong I am. <laughs> I'm going to double down. But my body wouldn't let me. And <clears throat> then uh, there was a death in my family, and I wanted to be back here for that. It all just kind of, you know, coming at the same time. But I didn't want to quit, so I was kind of, i kind of stop, and then I'd go back and forth. But I eventually had to admit that it's, that's not something that's for me anymore. <clears throat> so, <laughs> and then there was, I had a, I'll go ahead and talk about it because maybe somebody else can recognize it and it'll help them. But I started having panic attacks too. And not the kind where some queen says, oh girl, I'm going to have a panic attack. <laughs> I'm talking sweating, heartbeat just flushing, turning red, people looking at you and knowing something's wrong. And it was uh, a couple of years before I knew what a panic attack was because I didn't talk about it with people. I would just do it. I would just do the shows even though I was scared to death. Uh, <laughs> that was a whole other thing. So, these, you know, my can-do attitude and my don't-stop-me attitude was fighting with my body and it all kind of came around at the same time when it rained it bores honey <laughs> so then you packed up but i eventually go ahead <clears throat> so then you packed everything up and moved back to oklahoma i did i uh i <clears throat> i had to for my peace of mind for my health uh for my sanity <laughs> i had to be with something you know a drag is very lovely and the people are very real to you but it in a lot of ways it's kind of fake to me right um and when i got home i was like i I absolutely made the right decision for me it was what i needed to do i threw my cell phone into lake (laughs) 10 (laughs) killer i did and I didn't have one until this past birthday. <laughs> um, I had to unplug and get away from everything. So you've been, and then I was fine. You've been back here. I still here. have panic attacks, and I still have seizures, even today. But I'm fine. <laughs> so you've been back there six or seven years now. and Yeah. Does it feel like home? Does it feel like where you could envision yourself until your last day, just 
living out your life right there? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of, when I reconnected with Facebook, because I dropped off the face of Facebook for like five years too, um, I really need to unplug. And I just got back on like back in August, I think. But I, um, <clears throat> how do I explain this? I don't want to ever disappoint or offend anyone who who has a personal connection to my performances. And they're always wanting me to come back and, and do that. And a big part of me would love to be able to do that. But it's different now for me. I, I couldn't possibly do that. I, I have a completely different set of priorities, I guess, Right. for me. My, my parents are, you know, getting older and I'm helping to raise my niece. And those are the most sacred things I could ever do to me. And uh, being here for my mom and my dad and being of use to my family, oh, I could cry talking about it because now it's my turn to help them. And I'm lucky enough to be here to be able to do that and to have my niece depend on me as a sort of a parental figure has been incredibly nerve wracking because I'm always afraid I'm going to screw something up. <laughs> it's the most important thing I've ever done. And Raven was like practice for this. She has the most lovely costumes when it's dress up day. <laughs> oh, I bet she does. <laughs> it was like, and if anything breaks, Uncle Bonnie will get his glue gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm loving it I'm absolutely loving it and I think everything I've been through like I've always felt in life help prepared me for where I am today I'm just having but a hard time to come back and perform I'm having a hard time visualizing a <laughs> a thin Barbie doll dressed in a Wonder Woman outfit on horseback in Oklahoma that's just I cannot quite grasp that vision I don't think the horse. I think it's probably run from me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it's um, there's never a dull moment, and I'm very public about who I am, and very proud of Raven and everything I accomplished there, and that whole lifestyle. So I'm very public about it, even though I don't really go visiting with a lot of the people here. Right. I have very close friends that I stay in contact with, but. Um, how do I say this nicely? You know what? It was like, Monty's a little crazy. I think he's in Atlanta dressing up like a woman. <laughs> but once it was on HBO and in their living rooms, and it was cool, it was okay. That validated what you were doing. Yeah, and, and it's weird like that. So now everybody around here, they most of everybody around here is seeing the videos and the stuff on the internet and the more public stuff, but, and, and they're very, uh, accepting of me. I, I'm just me. I'm very proud of me. I'm not going to try to butch it up for anybody or pretend I didn't love duct tape a little more than I should have. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll talk about it with anybody. My niece has seen most all the videos. And my other nieces and nephews, and let's see, Brody's eight years old, but they they were going to see it. <laughs> Somebody would have showed them. Right. And they're really open-minded. Drag helped me. It helped everybody. It's helping these kids today because they're very grounded. They're very open-minded. And, I mean, what's more important than that? Right. I mean, raising a next generation of people that that are tolerant and loving, especially in today's world. Absolutely. <clears throat> now, even so this is the most important thing I've ever done and the most important thing I will ever do. Now, even though you, you will probably never perform as Raven on stage ever again, is there, the, is there the slightest interest in at least kind of recreating the Raven look, getting into the drag, doing a photo shoot with some friends or family just for fun, or is Raven completely kind of put away for eternity? 
No, no, absolutely. I, 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 um, I just naturally take it for granted that I think everybody else feels what I feel and understands what I understand. But no, I want to be real clear about that. Raven is still a big part of who I am. Um, I couldn't have been that good at what I did without being comfortable and that being a part of my life and who I am. But, uh, and, and I'm, I'm older now. I'm, I'm certainly not decrepit or, <laughs> you know, my body hasn't changed that much. I can certainly pull it off. But in my head, I'm thinking, God, will it ever be for them as big of an experience? Right. As it was back then, if I were to do it now, and would that be letting them down? Even if I, even if I, you know, were willing to sacrifice some ball games with the kids, or you know, some dinners with the family, and come and perform, I, I would still think that I wasn't quite up to what I used to be. But I've always thought that. And also, something I've been saying on Facebook, and a lot of people kind of jump on me for it, is that I'm not quite relevant anymore because I, I don't perform actively all the time. So that's when I say that, they're like, how can you say that about yourself? But it's true. And also there's too much noise out there. Everybody's got to be interviewed about something. And I love you and I, I like your site and it's about archival things. And I was all for it. But there's a lot of people out there that put out books and TV and just drag shows and opinions. It's just too much noise, and I didn't want to be a part of that. Well, yeah, we did not <laughs> have that. In don't, the... don't think that I won't get back up and drag if I feel the need. <laughs> I certainly I certainly am open to it. And then maybe when Rebel gets a little older, um, she can come and see a show, an actual show. And that's something I would do it for. <laughs> Enter but, to um, entertain her for her, her sweet 16 party or something. Right. <laughs> Here's Uncle Monty. <laughs> or would it be Auntie Raven at that point? I'm sorry, what was that? I said, would it be Uncle Monty or Auntie Raven? <laughs> Am I a gunkle or a manty? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm Uncle Monty to them. I'd never make them call me by another name. <clears throat> but they know who Raven is. That's and they know cool. it's a big part of who I am and what made me who I am today. And they, there's still big aspects of me that I'm very much Raven. They know when that eyebrow goes up that they need to stop doing what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Raven kind of honed your personality again. I would really love to perform again, and I'm not going to say that it's not going to happen. But there's just so many other things. It's very important because of circumstances that right. I would never go into publicly. It's very important for me to provide stability, uh, you know, and be here for her. Right. Um, and my family. It, it, I'm, I'm ten times more important to them than I was to anyone ever because they're family. But I really want to, Art. I really, really want to. Well, you'll definitely and have to keep I, us... I'll hear a song and I'll be like... Oh, God, I should be doing levitating right now. <laughs> I should... <laughs> but uh, I'm, not, I'm never saying no to it. I'm never saying no. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope that one day you pick up the phone and say, Guess what? It's time for Raven, Raven to come back for a command performance and we'll actually see you on stage again. I have a huge smile on my face right now, by the way, just hearing you say that. I, I, um, I believe it could possibly happen, and for some unbelievably ridiculous reason, people still think I'm relevant, and they still, oh, they give me so much love, and the, the personal things I receive on Messenger since I got back on Facebook changing lives and stuff. It just makes me cry sometimes. Well, you have to remember... And younger kids, now that I'm on Facebook, that are thinking they're suicidal. I mean, there's so many things that I I love about that. And I'll, I'll keep that as part of my life. And maybe when I come back to the stage, they'll still pile up for me. And I'll still give it right back. It's symbiotic. And it's, it's reality for me, even though it's drag. 
Well, you but have you Raven's have to. Raven's not gone. Raven's not gone, and she's never going to be completely. You have to remember that when you were first starting to explore the the gay bar scene and the performance scene, and you were getting out there on stage, you were like a teenager. You know, you were a young, a young man. And I was a chicken. <laughs> and you rose to stardom very quickly. It wasn't, you know, the people that were your age or 10 years younger, uh, yeah. later, you know, a few years down the road that were just coming up. Those people did not have, they, they did not connect to Louis White and Charlie Brown. You know, they were both way out of their out of their age range for them to be able to connect the way they could connect with this young guy that was up on stage blowing everybody away. You know, that was doing these incredible performances and getting all these uh, these tips and these wow. comments from fans. You were a kind of a ray of hope back then, because if you think about that in the 90s, the gay bars were wow. our social centers. They were our safe havens. That's where you went to connect and to be your authentic self. You could not do that at work for the most part. You could not do that in public or with your family for a lot of people. It was still a very closeted time for a lot of people. And you were one of the first people that they could see in their own age group that had done something to put a smile on their face and make them feel good about themselves. And those people are not old now. You know, a lot of your fans yeah. that were 20 or 19 when you started, or, you know, maybe they were 19 when you were 10 years into your career. Those are younger people that still have, you know, a memory of what you, how you impacted their coming out experience. They're dealing with their own, you know, who they were, uh, which I think is a little bit unique because, as you know, a lot of the performers you worked with were substantially older than you. They were not yeah. the same generation. So you were one of the few from your generation that really st stood out and shone bright back then that people could connect to. And I think that's why you're getting that kind of fan response is because those people are now becoming somewhat responsible adults. Maybe they're just turning 40 or 45 and they understand. Uh, yeah, I, what, hear from, I hear from them on Facebook. Yeah, and they understand what happened 20 or 30 years ago when they saw you on stage. So I think that might be one wow. of the reasons that you're, you know, you still have that I kind still of... Am, I still am floored by what you're saying. I mean, that you're talking about me having that kind of effect on other people. But I don't know how, but it just happened. And I connected to them. Uh, wow! I, I was it was affirmation every time someone would look in my eyes when they would come and give me their hard earned money or uh, write me a letter or tell me a story or bear their feelings. I'm still floored by it, but I have a huge healthy respect for that symbiotic relationship. I couldn't have done what I did without them. Right. I can't get up there and do that without the fuel for the fire, which is the people's reaction right. and me wanting to so badly to impress them. Um, but it, it did, it, it happened very quick and just like I wanted it to, it was great. It did happen very quick. And no matter if I never go back to Atlanta, if I, if I never do that, if I never perform again, if I never even go to another bar, Backstreet and the bars there, that, that was, it was, it wasn't just, you know, going out, it was a home. It really was. Right. Because that is where we found our acceptance and our like-minded people. And I thrived. I don't know how anyone could not thrive in that kind of atmosphere of acceptance and love and diversity. And you finally, for the first time, realize, hey, there's people like me. Exactly. Uh Bars are so important, and, and and sadly, a lot of them aren't around anymore. And I had a DJ friend of mine tell me on my last tour in 2014 that Grinder killed 
the bars. <laughs> I was like, no way. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, no, yeah. they're, it's different now. And I think there's a lot of factors. Tour, unfortunately, I did see a lot of differences from when I was there before, and it was very sad. I didn't see a lot of the connection. And a lot of the bars were closed. But there are still places. Club One in Savannah, they're, they're very yeah. much modeled after Backstreet. There's a lot of places that are still like that. Sadly, there's not a whole lot of them. So I understand, or there weren't before in Atlanta. There might be, you know, today. No, Atlanta doesn't, you know, right. Atlanta's biggest, um, I think, from what I've, what I've been told, Atlanta's biggest gay bar dance floor right now, I believe, is the Heretic. Oh, you're kidding me. Oh, Art, what are you going to do about this up there? Well, now I'm not, I'm I'm not there. Torches. I'm not there. I moved down wow. to Tampa, Florida, so... Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Folks, this is a real interview. We didn't plan this or talk about it from the beginning. <laughs> yes. Wow. Uh, I'm in Tampa, um, Florida. Yeah, everybody's moved away from there, and a lot of the bars have closed, and, and it's not the same place as it was when we were there. You know, one thing but does give... To live through it. One thing does give me a little bit of hope. Um, I don't know if you saw this on Facebook a couple days ago. There was a big bar in Los Angeles. I don't know if you ever... Did you ever perform in Los Angeles? Yeah. Did you know a club there called uh, Rage? Called what? Rage. R-A-G-E. Uh, no, and that's not where I performed. Uh, I don't remember. Then okay. Remember. Rage, Rage was a pretty big... So long ago was a pretty big club in LA and they closed down that last year or the beginning of, the, I think it was last year. Um, but, um, a couple of days ago they announced that Lance Bass in partnership with a couple of other people has leased the building and is planning to launch a brand new gay bar in West Hollywood. That will be the largest gay bar in the country. So, wow. So that gives me a little bit of hope that nightlife is not completely dead. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, Lance is a cool guy. I've met him a couple times. Uh, he's sincere. And, of course, obviously he is, he's he gay. Is, I've met him once, but he was very sweet. You're, you're correct. He's very um, his husband, sincere, Michael. He's got a lot of heart, so I'm glad he's doing that. And to, to know that he's behind it and Michael, his husband, uh, who's an incredible mm-hmm. artist, that they'll have a hand in this. It gives me hope that, you know, maybe we do have some future for a re-envisioned kind of, of gay nightlife that's not just reverting to the little back alley hole in the walls that it was in the, you know, 50s or 60s. So I'm kind of hoping... Now I can get the password, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of hoping... Maybe he'll open a, 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 a... He'll branch out and open one in Atlanta... But you know what? Uh, they've got to have a place to put all of these queens that Rue is cultivating. Ugh. I mean, drag is... I get on Facebook and I get disappointed sometimes because I hear a lot of people bitching and moaning about they think he's this or transphobic. Or, and I just want to cry. I'm thinking, look where we are. Look what he's done. Look what we had to go through before. Do you remember? And he's cultivating an army. And yeah, we got to have bars to give those ladies places to perform. Do you remember um, RuPaul in Atlanta or had he already left by the time you... Ru moved away. Okay. Uh, just, or I, I'd seen him once there and it, it wasn't pretty. I think he had on a mohawk. <laughs> oh, I remember. Uh, I, yeah. He... But then he, he moved away and, uh, and uh, I didn't, really get to know him until later and she came back and I think I went to oh it was Outright Books God we love that place uh huh um I love that she was doing a book signing there and I went and she introduced herself she put her hand out and introduced herself and shook my hand which stayed with me and I still do that I always look people in the eye and shake their hand so they know that I'm listening uh and I told her I did drag, and she said, what's your drag name? And I told her it was Raven. She said, you're Charlie Brown's daughter. And I was like, oh, God, yeah. And then, you know, I got to know her after that, but, <laughs> yeah. She's pretty amazing. 
was, she was pretty scary back in the day. Oh, I love I, it. When I first moved to Atlanta, which was about <laughs> about five years before you got there, when I first moved to Atlanta, uh-huh. RuPaul used to do kind of pop up shows um, at weekends. The old weekends that was on Peachtree Street near Tenth. Uh, that's, that's where that's where I first. That's where I was the six eight eight spring weekends. No, that's no, no. Where they found they found me. That's where I started. Weekends was also yeah. located on Tenth and Peachtree. Oh, just up there, right? Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, across. Like where the Roxy is? Or... <laughs> uh, no, it was over. You know where the Margaret Mitchell house is? Oh yeah, it was. And like, I didn't burn that down, but yeah, I know where that is. It was about half a block north of there, on the same side of the street. Um, there used to be a little I building. I remember that. I mean, I didn't see it, but I remember people telling me that's where. Yeah, and Blake's used to be right yeah. across the street from there. Blake's was directly wow. across the street. But um, Weekends was this little dark hole-in-the-wall bar that had a 24-hour liquor license. And RuPaul and his sidekick, Lahoma, used to uh-huh. write posters on a sheet of like typing paper with black marker and photocopy them on colored paper. And staple them around the telephone poles. <laughs> yes. And staple them on the telephone poles around Midtown that RuPaul and Lahoma would be performing at 2 a.m. at weekends or whatever. And that's how, and he, he would show up in a pair of Daisy Dukes and like a cut off t shirt or tank top or whatever and jump and on one of those. And rollerblades. Yeah. It was just like no production, no special effects, just some kind of crazy. Dancing and singing and stuff, but Atlanta had that kind of a drag vibe energy back then. It was, you know, performance was everywhere. Uh, you know, six eighty eight. And RuPaul was the queen of self promotion back then. Yeah, she, she made it herself. So she worked hard at that. Yeah, but <laughs> and a few that. years I later, of, I have a poster that says RuPaul is star booty. Someone gave to me. It's one of the original posters. Yeah, somewhere in my trunk. It was a crazy life back then, but. So this I little... wish I would have been able to have seen one of her shows. Um, I just happened to where I never, you know, I was a little late for that. Yeah. Back uh, when she was uh, <laughs> very flamboyant. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, he's changed a lot. But um, it was, it was a great... And what she's doing today is phenomenal. To, for that to be on uh, <laughs> a major network, at night, it's, I mean, come on, we well, had to fight for that, and I've, I've, I've stomped up and down in my heels and protested many a time, but where we are today is, oh, I know, I'm still floored by it, I'm still yeah. floored by it, but I'm not surprised by it, because uh, drag is great entertainment, it's great entertainment, well, and, there and were... the queen's going to be a bit bitchy backstage, and I always said attitude belongs on stage, not backstage, but... You know that makes good for TV, and I, it's, it's helping our 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 whole cause. Well, there are a few of you that uh, that broke into mainstream television on one level or another over the years. Um, uh-huh. You know that that went on to various talk shows, uh, Phil Donahue or um, Sally Jesse Raphael or whatever, oh, and, yeah. and kind of broke the ice too. I was just interviewing Jimmy James. Amber did a lot of those. Yeah. And Jimmy James did a lot of those. Jimmy did a lot. Yeah. He's still out there. I, 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 I have to see that interview. I'm sorry I haven't seen it yet. I'm sorry to say that because, you know, I love you and I'm a huge fan of Jimmy James as I fan out every time I would meet him. And this... even after, you know, I, <laughs> he recognized me as someone, I guess, important, I still would freak out. He was... He's amazing. He's pretty active on Facebook, too. He's If you go to Facebook, he's on there. He does a live uh, stream show every every Thursday. Uh, I did not know that. Yeah, but he's not doing it in drag anymore. He says he went from from drag to what he calls Glamour Dyke, which is his... (laughs) uh, I can hear him saying that. That's awesome. (laughs) You know, he's put on a little bit of weight. But he puts um, the make the kind of drag makeup, you know, the eyeliner and, and mascara and blush and whatever, and some glitter. I'm sure he's still gorgeous. 
Yeah. yeah. But he doesn't yeah. put on the wigs and try to be Marilyn Monroe. He does different voices. He does dozens of them. Um, live yeah. singing. I, I heard his, uh, Billy Holiday, I heard his Judy Garland when he would do Marilyn, you know, he would kind of, you know, branch out and sing other things. Yeah. And I, him and Joey Arias are uh-huh. just, I just, I think they're aliens. It was really good catching up with you, and it's so good to know that, you know, you had such a fulfilling career in performing as Raven, and yet it's been sandwiched by such a kind of wholesome family life on both ends. I know. And, you know, it's like the perfect blend. It's it's so rewarding to hear something like that instead of hearing that somebody had, you know, a 40-year career on stage and then fizzled uh-huh. out and flopped on their face and got run over by a bus or something. You know, it's nice I'm to know sure that I've heard I've heard so many stories and they just they they, <laughs> they get different every time. But I mean, that's that's who I am. That's where I'm at, and I'm I know a huge part of our community. You know, is separated from their family and they don't have that experience. And I recognize that and I respect it. And I, uh, it makes me appreciate what I have, my family, even more. And just to be able to be here for them is, wow, that's great. But I haven't forgotten about who made me, you know, my mom. But I also haven't forgotten about who made me famous was the people and Raven. And I, I'll return to that someday, whether it's in my head or <laughs> in the form of some show. But yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate you saying that. Oh, you're quite welcome. It's very fulfilling. Well, we look forward to hopefully seeing you perform again one day. But if not, we have video and memories of 25 <laughs> wonderful years of Raven, you know, entertaining the masses. Oh. So thank you. Thank you, Art. Thank you so much. And oh, you're welcome. And, and I really would like to thank everybody listening to this because they're listening to this and they through my crazy point of view. And that concludes another segment of the Gay Archives podcast. You can find more podcasts at gaybarchives.com slash podcast. We also have more information about this podcast and links to the other podcasts we have completed. We hope you enjoy your trip down memory lane. <laughs>